pray as we come and look at God's word together. Heavenly Father, we do thank you so much for these studies in the book of Acts. <clears throat> we thank you for the encouragement it is that your word is unstoppable <clears throat> and continues to go out. Father, please, as we understand the greatness of the Lord Jesus Christ, may we be encouraged and convicted to keep sharing your word. And we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I don't know about you, but I think it's very easy to be distracted. So my wife, Jane, asks for a cup of tea. And so I dutifully head into the kitchen to make her a cup of tea. Lying on, the, uh, lying on the table in the kitchen is a letter that looks important. And so I open it and I begin to read it. By the time I've finished it and worked out that it's a bill I've got to pay or something, I've slightly forgotten about the cup of tea. Or I don't know if you had the experience of um, somebody's told you about this really, really good website, okay? And I'm going to be really good and help me to understand some aspect of the Christian gospel that I need to understand. And so <laughs> I go online and I'm thinking about it. And then I notice that there's a message on my social media. You know, somebody sent me some message. And, well, 20 minutes later, I've looked at various other messages and I've chased various other things down. And, well, I never quite got around to that website I was meant to look at. Now, you might say both those are fairly banal and trivial, and I think you're right, apart from having a disgruntled wife, because where is the cup of tea? But, but of course, it can be far more serious, I guess, if you're, if you're driving somewhere and you suddenly get distracted and there's something outside the side window and you see something there and you turn around and then suddenly you're in an accident. That's more serious, of course. And I'll pass to say, say there's another even more serious aspect of distraction that can happen for Christians. There can be, I think that's the main message from today's passage, is there can be a great danger that the early church was going to be distracted. There's a great danger that churches and Christians today can be distracted. The main purpose of the church, I hope we're fairly clear now as we've been looking at the book of Acts. This is our last visit to the book of Acts for a while. Next week we're going to look at the book of Ezra. If you want to get ahead, then read the book of Ezra during the week. But let's come back. We've looked at this verse many times, but if we could just remind ourselves one last time. Acts chapter 1 on page 1092. This is really the sort of, remember Costas preached on this right back in November, I think, October, November time when we began this series. And he talks about God's agenda. What is God's agenda for the world? <clears throat> and Acts chapter 1 verse 8 is a good summary of that. And we've been reading it together. So for this last time, let's read it together. This is Jesus speaking to uh, his apostles, to uh, his followers. Let's read together. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. So what is Jesus' agenda, what is the purpose for his church? That we are to be his witnesses, beginning in Jerusalem, that's what we've been reading about, moving out to Judea and Samaria, and ultimately going to the ends of the earth. And so far, over those next five or six chapters in Acts, we've seen this being carried out in Jerusalem. But we've also been aware of various things that have tried to stop the message from spreading. The most obvious one is we've seen persecution. We saw that last week. The authorities do not like this message of Jesus spreading. And so they've arrested the apostles. They've told them to shut up. They've put them in prison. They've beaten them because they want this to stop. By God's grace and, and the strength of the Holy Spirit, the apostles have continued to proclaim the good news of Jesus to uh, everybody. We saw a slightly more subtle um, way of stopping it with the story, the sort of stark story of Ananias and Sapphira. Remember that, that married couple who come, they sell a field, they give some money, but it's not so much money as uh, the field that they sold. And, and I think the problem is that they, they sort of hope that they will get some of the glory. So I guess there are people in the church who rather than all the glory want to going to Jesus, somehow want some of that glory and the praise of people to be on them. And sadly, uh, we may know in our hearts that that can be sometimes the way that we think, and it can be in my heart. And now we come to another problem. I mean, again, it's very subtle. Come back to chapter 6. 
And it's really the idea of distraction, the idea of being taken off course. I guess we're in a, in a sailing boat and we're heading towards the shore and a, a wind comes and blows us off course and we suddenly find we're going in a different direction uh, because, yeah, because of that wind. And that, that idea of distraction can be very much alive today. There are all sorts of things that the church is called to do. There's all sorts of things that, that the church calls to do, both by people inside the church and outside the church. So these are just some things I've heard people say, this is what the church should be doing. So the church should be promoting the vaccine program. The church should be working for social cohesion. The church should be working at feeding the poor. Now those are good things to be doing. They're not wrong things to be doing. But they are not the number one purpose that the church is called to do. And there can be a great danger that we'll lose sight of the main thing we're meant to be doing, which is making Christ known. So let's follow the story through. Let's think about the problem. Uh, so I've got three very simple headings. If you've got a handout, the problem, the solution, and the result. So if you've got a handout, the first thing we're going to look at is the problem. Well, actually, it's more than one problem, but let's begin. Got the problem up, great. And it's interesting to note that here we have a healthy, vibrant church. And we, it, we, I don't know about you, but you read the early chapters and you think, wow, what a church it would have been to be involved in. They seem to be preaching. They loved each other. They met together. They were enthusiastic about telling people about Jesus. What a great church it would have been to be part of. And maybe you look at other churches and think, oh, I wish I could be child like part of that church. It just seems to be growing and it's just so vibrant. It's fantastic. Um, but it's it's important to note that even this great, vibrant church has problems. So, so sometimes it's easy to think, well, all the problems are with our church. And you look at these other churches and think, oh, if only I was a part of that church, it would be fantastic. But all churches are full of sinners, full of people who still have rebellion against God in their hearts. And so all churches are going to have problems. And the problem here that we're told about is a problem, really, of racial injustice. Let's pick it up in verse 1. In those, day, in those days, when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So we're told about these two groups, okay? The first guys are these Hellenistic Jews. Well, who are the Hellenistic Jews? Uh, these are basically Greek Jews, if you like. The uh, empire at that time, I know it's a Roman empire, but it was still dominated by Greek culture. Greek was still the main language that people spoke, and Greek culture still dominated, even though it was the Romans who were in charge. So they'd probably spoken Greek. They'd have probably dressed like Greeks um, and probably had other parts of Greek culture. So that's one group. And then you've got this other group who are the Hebraic Jews. They were probably born inside Israel. They probably wouldn't have spoken Greek. In fact, they were honest. They'd have probably been slightly suspicious of Greek culture. And, uh, yeah, they'd have spoken probably Hebrew, Aramaic, and um, that would have been their main language. They wouldn't have dressed in Greek clothes. And so you had these two groups. And maybe the, uh, we don't know why there was this um, problem with the daily distribution of food. Was it the Hebraic Jews in the heart of hearts? Someone thought maybe these Greeks were, weren't quite kosher or would just maybe contaminate the food. We don't really know, but there's clearly some problem with these two different groups of people getting along. But here is a growing church, and here is an issue which is basically one of racial injustice. And of course, that is an, an, an area that we're very aware of in our society today. Um, I've been, I'm a cricket fan, and uh, if you're a cricket fan, you'll know that Yorkshire Cricket Club has just been completely just overwhelmed by issues of racial injustice. And it's very sobering to read it here uh, in the church. And I think we need to come to this very humbly. I think there can be a danger that we sort of think, well, I'm not a racist, and we're very quick to point the finger at somebody else. We say, well, they're worse than me. But I think when we come to pastors, we just need to be humble, and we need to acknowledge that it's just so much easier to get on with people like me, people I understand, and much harder to get on with people who are different from me who I find harder to understand. Maybe that's because of language, maybe it's because of culture. And we need to ask God to help us. And of course, it's not just different, uh, different 
ethnicities. It can be economic. People can look down on people because they're poor or look down on people because they're rich. Or it can be educational backgrounds. I was with a friend who's a pastor of the church. He said that the differences there aren't particularly between different races, but between different educational backgrounds. So if people have a degree, they tend to get on better. And people who maybe aren't, don't have a tertiary education. That, that, that's where the fault line can be. Uh, it can be uh, generational. Uh, we can think, we can look down on older people or we can look down on younger people. We are very good at it. So that's the first problem. This is problem, or, well, I put racial injustice. Well, it's just that treating people who are different from us as if they're not equal with us. So that's the first problem. The second problem really is one of grumbling. It's easy to, to, to miss this, but so the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews. Um, if we read the Old Testament, uh, when Israel is in the wilderness, there is a lot of grumbling and complaining. It's exactly the same word that is used here. And it's often actually ironically grumbling about food or grumbling about the leadership or grumbling about God. And the problem here is, it's wrong against us. The Bible is clear. Jesus is very clear in his teaching. If somebody offends us in some way, we're meant to go directly to them and say, Gently, you've offended me. Can we try and reconcile and sort this out? But so often what we do is actually we don't go to the person who's uh, hurt us or wronged us. We just talk about them behind their backs. And uh, again, that's a problem here. that they, It feels like they weren't really engaging with, with uh, the people who had wronged them, but they were speaking behind their backs. They were complaining. And again, I find that very challenging. When somebody wrongs me, how do I, even, even if you know, I, I, you know, I'm right in the fact that I've been wronged, how do I respond to that? Do I go and talk to the person directly? Or do I just grumble and complain behind their backs? So those are the problems. But actually, according to our passage, there is a far, far greater problem for the church. And it's this problem of distraction. Verse 2, so the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God to wait on tables. The apostles see that if all their time got taken up with this problem, they would stop making Jesus known. They stop teaching the word to the church. They stop proclaiming the good news to the Lord Jesus Christ, to people around now, it's important to say that the, the problem of racial injustice, the problem of grumbling, you know, they're not insignificant. We're not saying, oh, these problems aren't important. They are very, very important. See, clearly racial injustice is a massive problem that we need to keep dealing with. But it's still not the main purpose of the church. The main purpose of the church is making Jesus known. And it's interesting that the problem of distraction is not one that is just new to the early church. It's actually a problem that Jesus himself faced. Can we have the next slide? I don't know if you can read. This is the reading that Catherine read, so I'm sorry. I think you just read that. So Jesus, he's been preaching in the synagogue. He's healed uh, Peter's mother-in-law. Um, and that evening after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and the demon-possessed. The whole town gathered at the door, as it would have. Jesus could heal anybody. You would have had anybody who was sick, you would have brought them to Jesus. And Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons, but he would not let the demons speak because they knew he was. So it was an amazing evening where people crowd around where Jesus is staying to get him to heal. Verse um, 35. So the next morning, while it was still dark, Jesus gets up, leaves the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions, that's Peter and his companions, went to look for him. And when they found him, they exclaimed, everyone is looking for you. Well, they would be, wouldn't they? I mean, all the people who couldn't get there last night, they'd you know, gone and got the people the following morning. They might have traveled through the night to come. But look what Jesus says in response. Jesus replied, let us go somewhere else. So he leaves people who need to be healed. He leaves them. It's very striking because he wants to go everywhere else. So he can preach there also. That is why he has come. So again, something very important, healing people, caring for people, very important. But Jesus still says, it is not my priority. My absolute priority is to preach the kingdom of God so people can know God and know me. Which leaves us with a very important question, which you may ask is, why is talking about Jesus so important? Why is it the number one priority of the church? As we look at our world, 
you know, with the fight against racial injustice, that's important. The fight against COVID, that's important. Fight against poverty, that's important. Why is telling people about Jesus more important? Well, I hope in one of our studies in Acts will help, have, will help us to answer that question. Why is it important that Jesus may know? Why is that the central purpose of the church? Well, because Jesus is God's King and Saviour. And it's only through Jesus that we can know God and his forgiveness before it is too late, before we meet him on the day of judgment. It's only through Jesus that God's blessing and refreshing and forgiveness comes. Only through Jesus can we know God's grace and mercy. Only through Jesus can we have a place with him in all eternity when he returns to restore all things. That is why it is so important. Whatever our situation in this life is, to hear about Jesus, to take hold of Jesus, is the most important thing. And interesting, if we want to transform society, we want a society that takes racial injustice and poverty seriously, then actually we still need to keep preaching Jesus because it's only through Jesus that we will have a transformed society. So we see that in the early chapters of Acts, this glorious society. They, had, they, they were so generous, they kept giving and helping people. So that's not to say these other problems are not, you know, not, they're not, I'm not saying they're irrelevant. They're not, they're very important. But they're not the most important thing. So that's the problem. And the problem of being distracted by important things. They say they're not trivial and important things, they're important. Well, let's now look at the solution, verses three to six. So the apostles go on in verse three. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom we will turn this responsibility over to them. So the first part of the solution is to get others involved. Next slide. To get more people involved. So they say, well, this isn't for us. So what we're going to do, we're going to get seven men to lead this work of making sure that uh, the food is properly and evenly distributed. They get more people involved. And elsewhere in the New Testament, Paul uses the image of a body, the church as a body with the idea that we all, we're all different. We all have like different parts of the body and we all have different skills. You know, like these, you know, my hand can do all sorts of things, but it needs my foot to move around. You know, my eye can see, but I need my ears to hear as well. The idea is that, that each member of the church is different. We have different skills and different abilities and we're meant to be using them. So today, some will be making the coffee. Some are good at the technical stuff. Some are good at pastoral care. Some are good at teaching. Some are good in crash and Sunday school. I think this week we're going to should get our next uh, rotor out for uh, so next, this week we should get our next rotor out for serving at church on Sundays. And I just want to say a massive thank you, thank you to Kelly and Luke for doing that. But I want to say thank you for so many being willing to sign up on our rotor in order to help out in so many ways. It's very much appreciated. I remember another church I went to for a while. It's not Christ Church Leighton, but it's another church I went to, and it was basically the expectation that the vicar or the minister would do everything. So somebody might have an idea about something that they thought was good for the church to do, and they send the vicar an email, I think we should be doing this. And often his response was to say, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. Why don't you go on and go and do it? To which a slightly horrified email will come back, well, it's your job. You're the vicar. Well, I'm, glad, I'm very relieved to say thank you that uh, you're not like that, that you are very good at um, getting on with stuff and yeah, doing lots of stuff. Because that, well, it was a disaster at times. Um, there's a great danger the church then, you know, just implodes on the, a very tired vicar. Or the other problem is that um, we can become so wrapped up by our own issues that we lose sight of taking the gospel out. So we can be so worried about issue racial injustice in the church that we forget, yes, that's an important issue, but we've still got to take the gospel out. And so that's the, there's the second part of the solution. Uh, next slide. Keep prayerfully making Jesus known. That's the main thing to keep teaching the word of God so that people are built up and so that people outside the church can hear about the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ and be uh, forgiven. So having delegated the task of this food distribution, the leadership say they will focus on prayer and teaching the word. They'll focus on spending time praying and teaching the word, both in terms of preaching to the church, to the, preaching to the church to encourage them, but also in terms of taking the gospel out to those who are uh, outside. Uh, sorry, I've missed a kid's question. My second kid's question. 
is what did the apostles say must happen? What did the apostles say must happen? Well, the first question is why is it important that we keep telling people about Jesus? And again, I want to say it's a massive thank you to uh, the leadership here, the other elders, to Gerard, to Costas, to Philippe, for all the hard work they do uh, in terms of teaching and preaching. I thank you for the ladies. Thank you for uh, Jane and, and Deborah and Carol, part of the, the um, women's ministry team, and lots of others you teach as well. So I just want to say thank you to all of you for your support, for your encouragement, and for your teaching in so many different ways. Um, you know, youth group, midweek groups. Um, it was great to have a three-course an hour. Uh, we try and have a monthly prayer meeting amongst the elders on Thursday morning. It's just great to get together to pray, to lift our many concerns to the Lord, to pray that God would help us to keep preaching the word. And the other interesting thing about this is that of the seven names we get, thank you, Catherine, for reading it so well, the seven names we get, the first two, Stephen and Philip, so they've been delegated to the food distribution uh, team. But actually, they spend the next part of the Bible actually teaching themselves. So chapter 7, you get a long, I think, I think it's the longest sermon in Acts. Um, the longest sermon in Acts, who's it preached by? Well, Stephen, who'd been delegated to the food distribution team. And yet, he gets an opportunity to share the gospel and speak the gospel. And I come over a page with me to chapter 8. Uh, chapter 8. And in verse 5, in chapter 8 and verse 5, on page 1101, we read this. It says, where it says Philip in Samaria. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. So here are two people on the food distribution team. And what do they end up doing? They went up, end up preaching the gospel. So just because you're sort of, you don't see teaching as your sort of number one primary ministry, that's not to stop you from speaking. So two of the seven people not only helped with the distribution of food, but also preached the gospel. So whatever our gifts are, whatever roles in the church God has given us, let's pray that God might also give us opportunities to share the good news with others. So we've thought about the problem, the problem of racial injustice, the problem of complaining, the problem ultimately of distraction. We've thought about the solution. Get more people involved. And so I'm really encouraged by the number of people who are involved. And keep the main thing, the main thing. Keep making Jesus known. Keep preaching God's word, both to build up the church and to keep us looking outward, to share the gospel with people. We need to keep doing that. And so finally, we read of the result in verse 7. So we come back with me to chapter 6 and verse 7. Chapter 6 and verse 7. <clears throat> so the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly. And a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. So as the word of God is preached, as Jesus is made known, as the gospel is proclaimed wonderfully and gloriously, it spreads. And the number of disciples in Jerusalem grows. It's a glorious summary of the first part of Acts. Remember back in chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus was to be uh, proclaimed in Jerusalem. Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. So here it is, the end of that first section with the proclamation of the gospel uh, in Jerusalem. Jesus called his followers to preach the gospel in uh, Jerusalem, and they've done that, and the community has grown. Uh, third kid's question, what happens when Jesus is made known to others? What happens when Jesus is made known to others? As they preach the gospel, so the gospel spreads. As well, of course, maybe just, if you like, turning that point on its head. If the word of God is not preached in the church, the word of God doesn't go out, if Jesus isn't made known, then the church won't grow. And sadly, many churches do lose sight of the gospel going out, lose sight of the gospel, the, the gospel in their own churches, and lose sight of the gospel going out. They get caught up in all sorts of things, even good things but they lose sight of making Jesus known. And as a result, there is no growth. In fact, sadly, the church shrinks. And so it's been great here at Grace Church once that even we haven't seen numerical growth, we have seen people converted. We have seen lives transformed by this gospel. We thought last week about how it's great to see God's gospel growing all over the earth. We thought about the huge growth of the gospel in Africa 
as the church has been made known. One of the most striking places where the church is growing is Iran at the moment, as the gospel is made known. So people are being converted there. God's word is preached and Christ is made known. And it's great for us as a church to be part of this nationwide passion for life mission around Easter, as Jared was talking about. I just want to encourage us to keep our, our focus on taking the gospel out in that situation. It's great to be praying for those around us. It's great to pray that God would open doors for us in our neighborhood, in our families, in our workplaces, maybe in our social circle of friends. Maybe thinking about people we might be able to invite to the uh, coffee shop event, the uh, city place event we've got uh, in, at the beginning of March. Who might we be able to invite to that event? Who might we be able to speak the gospel to and pray that God would indeed bring them to hear the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, as I said at the beginning, it is easy for us to get distracted and to end up doing something else. It's easy for the church to get distracted and lose sight of that main purpose. It's challenging because it's, it's easy to be distracted by really good things, really important things. Racial injustice is an important thing we need to deal with. Food distribution is an important thing. Well, the early church was threatened by that. And so the solution they came up with was very important. Get more people involved. Church, act like a body. You all have different gifts. You all have different abilities. Let's use them to serve God's church, to build up the church. And at the same time, we must keep the main thing the main thing. We must keep making Jesus known as the central purpose of our church. I'd like to turn a couple of questions. Maybe if you're going to stay around for coffee, how might we be distracted from making Jesus known? And why is it so important that we make Jesus known? Maybe you discuss them over coffee or lunch or um, maybe use them in the Bible studies during the week. Well, let's pray that we would indeed keep gospel preaching the main thing. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want to praise you for the great gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we praise you that you sent your son into the world to live that extraordinary life, to die for us, to rise again. Father, we praise you that he is exalted at your right hand. And today he is pouring out your forgiveness and your blessing. Father, we praise you for those who told us about these things that we might come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, Father, we pray for ourselves. We pray for Grace Church once. We pray for our other partner churches in this area. We think of the Browns in Bologna. We think of the college in Kazan in Central Asia. Heavenly Father, we pray you would help us uh, to keep preaching the gospel. I think of all the gifts and the abilities and the skills that you've given people here. I thank you for so many people here serving so um, diligently, giving up time and money and energy. Thank you. I want to thank you for the elders, for all the teaching and praying and leading they do, Father. And so, Father, I pray that you would help us to keep that main thing the main thing, not to be distracted away, to remember how wonderful the Lord Jesus Christ is. Please help us to make him known, to keep that central in our churches. And Father, in mercy, we pray, Father, that indeed your word would spread. The number of disciples in Wanstead would increase rapidly, Father, and Woodford and London, Father, and across the nation, across your world, Father. We cry out to you for that. In Jesus' name, amen.